Hey folks, this is Riker with a gaming news wrap-up video where we discuss the happenings of the week. This week's topics include the latest Diablo 4 news, including the hunt for the secret cow level getting some promising leads. Final Fantasy 16 releasing to excellent reviews. The FTC's latest efforts to stop Microsoft from buying Activision Blizzard, and more. As always, discussion timestamps can be found in the description below. But right before you skip ahead, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted to new Saturday episodes and stay up to date with gaming news highlights. Starting off with Diablo 4 news. We got a hot fix this week that fixes the issue in which the druids were getting unique barbarian items to drop. That will no longer be the case. And I know when that hot fix happened, there was some concern of, oh, did the Barbarian's Hoda build get a secret stealth nerf? That all got sorted out. If there was anything wonky going on there, it has now been fixed. So everything should be back to normal. Hoda was not nerfed. There was no intentional nerf there happening and it is resolved. We also got this week the reveal of the giant freaking statue of Lilith that will have the thousand hardcore player names chiseled into it. This thing is huge. It's like 10 feet tall or even more. Could easily be 12 feet tall. Now again, this is for the first 1,000 players to reach level 100 on Hardcore. And it seems there might have been some confusion because the race isn't actually over is what I'm given to understand. So if you're getting close, keep pushing until Blizzard comes out and confirms that the 1,000 people are locked in, those names are finalized, you know, who knows. Then, I didn't expect this was going to happen, but we got a follow-up on the Whoopi Goldberg story. A couple weeks back, we spoke about how Whoopi Goldberg was complaining she herself was saying that she was pissed, she was upset that Diablo 4 was not coming out on Mac, that she pre-ordered the game, assuming it would be on Mac because every previous Diablo game had been on Mac. Turns out she's genuinely a Diablo player. You look back 10 years on her show The View, she's talking about playing Diablo, so this isn't some publicity stunt, she genuinely plays the franchise. Uh, but she, she games on Mac, she owns a Mac, she's... Probably not super tech savvy, just based on how she's discussing these issues. Uh, and she was basically pleading with Blizzard to release D4 on Mac. I think she's now come to terms with the fact that that will not happen, but she posted an update video in which she said this. I'm still pretty upset with Blizzard and Samurai because I still have not heard from them. And I understand they want me to go get this Xbox, but I want my money back if you're not going to give me my game. What is happening with this? I didn't get the email that said, hey, Microsoft is taking over Blizzard. I didn't get that email or I wouldn't have bought the game. I want my game. I want my money back. Please, Blizzard, I love y'all. But this is a little out of control now because I know Blizzard and Microsoft, you haven't married yet. You're talking about marriage. So somebody needs to explain what's going on, please. So reaffirming that She's still pretty upset. She wants her money back. The story does have a conclusion. Following this, she posted another update in which Blizzard did apparently reach out to her. They gave her a refund. She's grateful to Blizzard for doing so, and she seems to mistakenly think that Microsoft is responsible for this. But if someone in her circle could have just installed Windows on her Mac, you know, there's ways to do that. Just shown her, you know, click this thing, load this, and, and, and you can get in the game. You know, she could be playing Diablo 4. But I still think it's just cool that the host of a show that my mom watches plays Diablo. Now in some other Diablo news. Again, a couple weeks back, we said that Diablo 4 had already made $666 million within its first, something like first week or 10 days, something like that. Well, we got some numbers now actually about Diablo Immortal. This information coming out of data.ai, but apparently Diablo Immortal in its first year, as it's celebrating now its one year anniversary, made $525 million on mobile. So this does not account for on PC, and it also does not account for third party Android marketplaces in China and elsewhere around the globe. Now, when I first read this headline 525 in one year, I thought that was on the lower end but I didn't realize it was just on mobile. I mean, especially if, if D4 within a couple of weeks already blew past that. But apparently Diablo Mortal was downloaded 22 million times, again, just on the platform we're talking about, not counting PC. And most of that money did come from China. I think that's 37% of that revenue came out of China with 24% coming from the US. But apparently now in this year, 
the US sales are overtaking the Chinese sales with the 2023 contributions being 33% from the US and only 19% from China. We do know that Blizzard and NetEase, Blizzard's Chinese partner for Immortal and its past games, they had a falling out, their 10-year partnership dissolved, it was an ugly breakup, NetEase's employees destroyed publicly on a live stream a Blizzard statue, it was, it was nuts. But the Immortal partnership was under a different agreement and that still is ongoing. I don't imagine that has anything to do with why the sales in China are lower this year. But regardless, the 525 million does put Immortal in the top three MMORPGs on mobile ever. Now in other news, it does appear that Diablo 4 has a secret cow level and the community is getting ever closer to solving it. For those who don't know, a little backstory, the secret cow level has been a thing in Diablo history. Some rumor once started back in the Diablo 1 days of some secret cow level. It was a bunch of hokum, but then the Diablo 2 devs actually made a secret cow level. By doing some combination of things that no player would ever think of doing, you could open up a portal to an Easter egg level where you fight giant... Well, I guess not giant, you just fight upright bipedal evil cows wielding bardishes. It's a beloved part of the Diablo franchise. When Diablo 3 released, there was no secret cow level originally. They did have a secret level, but it was a rainbow pink unicorn land. They later added an actual cow level, much more similar to the Diablo 2 one. But the running gag about the secret cow level is that the devs always pretend that it doesn't exist. Anytime they're asked about it, their public statements are always, there is no cow level. And leading up to the release of Diablo 4, the devs were saying this, although I have to admit that my understanding of their communication was, there's no cow level in the game yet. And I earnestly believed that message, that there really was no cow level, but that there would be in the future. But now through some data mining efforts, we have a whole Discord server that has been built up by the community where some some really clever people have been digging into files, digging into uh, data mines, and have been piecing together that there is something here. And it is tangible, and I am fully a believer that there is a cow level, and it's possible that we can't access it yet, but it is there. So it all starts with this area in the game that is vaguely shaped like the head of a cow. And there's three cows located over here on this end of the map. And there's also an entrance to, I guess, a cellar that you can't access right now. But it looks like some little place that you could enter, similar to the other cellars in the game. Now, what data miners have confirmed is that there is a quest in the game called Unknown. And this quest requires you to find three relics that are all Easter eggs of the former cow level. You have to cleanse those relics at the fountain in Ked Bardu in the Dry Steps and doing so should get a key, and that key should open the secret cellar. And that's kind of where their information ends. They don't really know what's supposed to happen after that, but presumably it should lead into the secret cow level. My personal theory is there's areas on the map that are blanks. Particularly right here, there's this area in the map that is not currently a place that you can travel to, but the boundary of the zone still includes it. There's only a couple of these areas. Now, one of them has to do with another secret zone, the Lost City of Yure. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but this area here is definitely a hidden city that will be revealed at some point in the game. If you stand just south of it, you can sort of see a little bit into it, and it is clearly going to be something that we could eventually visit. Once you stand in that zone, it is called the Lost City of Yure, but is a tiny, tiny region when the city is meant to be this big, majestic thing. It was originally supposed to be in Diablo 3. This is what it looked like. They had concept art for it and everything. So certainly at some point we will be able to go there. It will be unveiled. And so I imagine the cow level might be something as well, similar to that, that it could already be on the map and it's just hidden from us. Now the three relics that have been data mined, the three relics that players need to find, and there's only theories on how these things can drop, but the three relics include the bloody wooden shard, the musty tome, and the intricate metallic fragment. And these are all representations of the three components to opening the cow level in Diablo 2. You had to find Wurt's wooden peg leg, put it in the Haradric cube along with a Tome of Town portal, and that would open a portal to the secret cow level. So the bloody wooden shard, its flavor text reads, a worn blood-stained chunk of wood with tattered leather straps. The letter W has been crudely carved on one side. 
W for Wirt. Then the musty tome reads, the tattered leather bindings of an old tome. The deep blue dye has faded with age, and all the pages have been torn out. A tome of town portal is blue. And the metallic fragment is a metallic fragment of unknown origin, still humming with magical energies. It appears to be part of some ancient device. This is a chunk of the Horadric Cube, which sadly seems to be destroyed. Uh-oh. Good thing we solve a Kanai's Cube in Diablo 3, but it does explain why we don't find the Haradra Cube in Diablo 3. So these undisputably point towards a cow level. They're definitely pointing towards the Diablo 2 cow level. And through data mining, they can see that Wirt's leg can only be found in Hawazar or Kejistan. The Musty Tome can only be found in Skazgul or the Fractured Peaks. And the Metallic Fragment can only be found in the Dry Steps. But they don't know how exactly these things drop. Some kind of event makes them drop. They seem to have a very rare chance to drop, but no one has found any of these yet. There are only theories on how to get them to drop. But that is effectively where things are right now. My personal theory is that these can't drop yet. My personal theory is that this was just all put into the game in preparation for when some event will unlock and then we can open up the cow level. But who knows? I mean, I already didn't expect all this to be in the game, so... Maybe they're going to crack the code, someone's going to solve it, they're going to start finding these, they're going to cleanse them, they're going to get into that cellar, and then we're going to have our first sight, our first viewing, our first streams, our first videos of Diablo 4's Secret Cow level. I'll drop a link to their Discord below if you want to join in on the hunt or just give them a pat on the back for all their amazing work they've done. And you can also see all the rigorous testing they've already done. I'm sure a lot of you already have ideas. Oh, did you try doing this? Did you try doing that? They have tried so many things. So do feel free to just join that Discord and have a look. Now, in other news, Red Editor Competitive Trade seems to have offered proof that horses on PC move faster than horses on console. And what I believe this is tied to is the fact that on PC, as I cover in one of my, I think it's in my beginner's guide, the further you move your mouse, from the horse, the faster the horse moves, with the fastest speed being with your mouse all the way at the edge of the screen. Now with the controller, that doesn't work. Yes, the controller does have some degree of mobility in that you can move it slightly or you can move it all the way, and that will affect how fast the horse moves, but similar to the sorceress's teleport, where on PC you can actually teleport further by moving your mouse all the way to the edge of the screen, whereas on console you seem to be more restricted in how far you can teleport. It seems this has the same effect now with the horse. And assuming this test was legit, and there's no other factor at play that is making the horse move slower on console, then the most likely outcome of this, sadly, might be that Blizzard is going to nerf the horse speed on PC. But hopefully some solution could be found in which that does not happen. Now, another big topic in the community this week has been seasons and season... I'm going to use the term resets. It's not quite a reset. But basically, we have some new players who are starting to understand what's going to happen in a season. Uh, we have some older players who just were never on board with the idea of seasons requiring a new character. But to just super quickly sum up again when Season 1 launches for Diablo 4. As is the case in all modern ARPGs, you cannot bring a non-season character into a season. A season is a fresh start. You have to make a new character. Your non-season character does not get deleted. That progress doesn't go away. You can keep playing your non-season character, but you cannot bring that character into the new seasonal content. I have a full video talking about my thoughts on this. But one thing I will bring up as a bit of a complicating factor is now the introduction of the Battle Pass. And... While I do believe there are good reasons to not introduce seasonal content into non-season, that is, whatever new uh, mechanics might get added, I don't see a good reason to not let non-season players just earn the Battle Pass cosmetics on non-season. It doesn't seem to hurt the game if you can find some way to just get them to earn the cosmetics. Because as for the content itself, Again, one thing that has become common in modern ARPGs is the ability to add and experiment with content in a season to see how the community responds to it and kind of treat it like a testing ground for new activities, new mechanics, new systems under the condition that, well, we know it's just going to be there for three months. Therefore, if we introduce something that's crazy, broken, overpowered, well, it's going to go away. 
It's not going to fundamentally disrupt the base game, the non-season. It'll preserve the integrity of the non-seasonal experience. Whereas if it comes to both the base game and the season, well, there's no way to kind of remove it at that point. Anything in a season can be voided. We have that concept of voiding seasonal things that are too strong, overperforming. You're going into a season with the expectation that this is temporary, but once you add something into the base game, you can't take it away anymore without people getting very mad. And that's why successful seasonal mechanics generally, if they are received well and can be balanced, will make it into the base game. They will become fundamental features of the game. And the devs have explicitly said this, that they do imagine that some seasonal features, some seasonal mechanics, will make it into the base game. And I'm fairly certain they confirmed that the new items that they're going to be adding on a seasonal basis will come to both season and non-season at the same time. So, you know, build enabling items, you don't have to wait, you don't have to only play in season to get those items, you don't have to wait for the season to end, you will be able to benefit from those items immediately. Then lastly for Diablo, I just wanted to call your attention to the Honest Game trailer of Diablo 4. I always love Honest Game trailers, and I think they really nailed it with D4. I'm also just happy to see that this series is still around. Like, I remember when they did the Honest Game trailer for Diablo 3 a decade ago. On to some Final Fantasy news. The game is released to fantastic critic reviews on Open Critic. 93% of critics recommend it, and it has an average critic rating of 89 out of 100. It's getting praised all around from pretty much every angle imaginable. Gameplay, visual soundtrack, characters, story. With the only criticism seeming to revolve around the game's RPG aspects being pared down in favor of more action-oriented gameplay, and the story being more linear as opposed to open world. But lots of people seem to be suggesting this is a game of the year contender. And Final Fantasy 16 battle director Ryota Suzuki, who previously worked on Devil May Cry 5, Dragon's Dogma, and Monster Hunter, says this game is his personal masterpiece. And in more general Final Fantasy news, the Final Fantasy brand manager and Final Fantasy 7 remake producer Yoshinori Kitase has said that there's a lot of Final Fantasy 6 fans inside Square Enix that have asked him, when are we making a remake of Final Fantasy VI? And he's basically responding with, you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake isn't even finished yet, and it will be really difficult to make a Final Fantasy VI Remake. So for those hoping for something there, eh, probably not anytime soon. In other news, the legal battle between the FTC and Microsoft, Activision and Blizzard has commenced. I mean, you can argue it started many, many months ago, but court hearings have now begun. Basically, the FTC currently is trying to block the acquisition from going through before they are able to finish their review of whether it is in compliance with antitrust laws. The thing is, they're only going to be done the review after the deadline by which this acquisition has to have happened, which is in July. So Microsoft would either need to get an extension or the deal will just fall through. So in court, the FTC has been trying to give reasons to suggest that Microsoft should not buy Activision Blizzard, that this would be bad for competition in the market, and Microsoft's been trying to defend itself, saying, nah-uh, this will be great. And throughout the court hearings, we've actually learned a number of interesting factoids. Apparently, Activision at some point threatened to not release Call of Duty on Xbox unless Microsoft gave them a better rev share deal. Sounds just like Bobby, right? We learned that Bethesda apparently had a deal with Disney to create a AAA Indiana Jones game that would be multi-platform. But then after ZeniMax was acquired by Microsoft and ZeniMax owns Bethesda, this deal was changed and the game would only be on PC and Xbox. So not a great look for Microsoft there. But then in defense of the deal, Bethesda's Pete Hines came out and said if Starfield was going to release on more than just PC and Xbox, it would be releasing a lot later. Exclusivity helped their pipeline, helped them get the game out sooner. And honestly, it makes sense. When you have to develop across multiple platforms, that's a lot more QA. It's a lot more development process involved in ensuring compliance across the different hardware. Uh, Xbox and PC in general is also more similar to each other. Microsoft came out and just admitted that they lost the console wars. That for the past two decades, they've been in third place to Sony and Nintendo. Through some leaked emails, we also learned that the boss of PlayStation, who's been publicly saying, oh, oh, exclusivity, 
he apparently wrote in an email, quote, I'm pretty sure we will continue to see Call of Duty on PlayStation for many years to come. And he admitted that the acquisition wasn't an exclusivity play at all. Another juicy tidbit is that Microsoft expects the next generation of consoles to release in 2028. So that would be the PlayStation 6 and the Xbox, whatever the hell they call it. Maybe if they had a more coherent naming scheme, they would sell more units. Meanwhile, the FTC pointed out that these deals that Microsoft has made with Nintendo, NVIDIA, promising, you know, 10 years of non-exclusivity that'll keep releasing things on other platforms, yada yada. FTC is pointing out that these agreements are just riddled with loopholes that Microsoft could weasel out of. So, the fight's ongoing. At least we're getting some interesting information out of it. No resolution in sight yet. Then onto some Path of Exile news. Community manager Bex has come out and shot down the the rumors that have been building up that Path of Exile 2 would launch very soon. There's a new expansion for Path of Exile 1 that's launching a few weeks after ExileCon, which again is late July. And speculation was that, oh, this is actually going to be the Path of Exile 2 beta. Bex has said no. It's good, clear communication to set expectations there. Or that's exactly what they'd want you to think to support. No, 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 no. Bex also said that ExileCon is the jumping off point for Path of Exile 2's marketing and confirmed that Path of Exile 2 will have a presence at Gamescom and PAX West with playable demos and that we'll get all relevant dates at ExileCon in July. Now, Chris Wilson had previously said that they were hoping to target a late 2023 release for Path of Exile 2, but he had also mentioned that they'd want a nice year of hype marketing leading up to the release. So depending on which of those two you want to lean towards, we're either looking, again, late 2023 or potentially as late as a mid-2024 release for Path of Exile 2. But again, we'll find out more dates in just a few more weeks. Then in some StarCraft news, streamer Lyric tweeted to Blizzard boss Mikey Barra saying, We should talk StarCraft. Blow it up. The IP is dripping with ways to break out of RTS form. I love StarCraft, but Zoomers don't play RTS anymore and Boomers APM just lowers. But the StarCraft universe has insane potential and still one of the best. And I fully agree with everything he said there. StarCraft was one of my first loves and so much could be done in so many different venues with that IP. And Mikey Barra replied, I agree, it has insane potential and is still one of the best IPs out there. So hopefully we see something in StarCraft's future soon. Now, last we left off with StarCraft, anything RTS related was dead on arrival. The StarCraft team, the RTS team of Blizzard was systematically dismantled and everyone else just basically jumped ship and they've gone and formed other companies now to make their version of a new StarCraft game. Basically, all the RTS talent at Blizzard has gone away. It became clear to them that Activision was just not going to greenlight a new RTS. There's just not enough money in it. However, Microsoft makes RTS games, Age of Empires. Microsoft cares more about market share than pure money. So I do believe that if the Microsoft acquisition does go through, that a StarCraft 3 RTS and even a Warcraft 4 RTS are back on the table. We know that the last thing in the works for StarCraft that was publicly leaked was related to an FPS. And this was in, I believe it was 2019, summer of 2019, that the team was disbanded in order to move resources onto Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4. Then in another quick update here, out of nowhere, Nintendo revealed a remake of Super Mario RPG that will be releasing on Switch on November 17th. And it seems to be a pretty faithful remake of the original Super Nintendo game. Another title making headlines this week is Battle Bit Remastered. This is the top selling game on Steam right now, and it's a 254 player FPS made by a small team of four people. It costs only $15, and is a huge scale battlefield style game. No MTX, no other monetization, and it's in the top 10 most played games on Steam right now. The team worked on the title for seven years, and by keeping it a low poly type of game, they're able to have 254 players simultaneously on a map without really taxing your system. It can run on a potato computer. You really, honestly, whatever your computer is, you can probably run this game. And people are having tons of fun with it. And last in the news this week, E3, has been super cancelled. Not only is E3 of this year cancelled, but it seems the next couple of years are also cancelled. So, 
All indications are E3 is dead forever. On the Reset Era boards, these meeting results from the Los Angeles City Tourism Board of Commissioners confirmed that E3 2024 and E3 2025 were also cancelled. And I imagine the only reason that we don't see future E3 is also cancelled is just because they probably didn't book those other E3s in advance. Presumably the E3 organizers would be in contact with the city to pre-reserve the venue years in advance, and I imagine they didn't do it for 20 years in advance. So this is just another nail in the coffin for E3. Or it means E3 2026 confirmed. And that's gonna wrap up this video, folks. But do be sure to check out last week's video in which we discussed how the endgame or hardcore players of Diablo 4 and the more casual players of Diablo 4 were having disagreements on how the game should go. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.